Hey everyone, I'm Tyler Weingartner and welcome to the latest episode of Meet the Maker. Uh, my name is Tyler, I am the video producer here with Make Magazine and today we are joined by Hal Rucker. Uh, Hal Rucker is a designer and inventor. Um, some of his most famous work is, uh, or his most visible work is uh, building combat robots. That's something he's been doing for quite a bit of time. But Hal, you do quite a little, quite a bit more than that. Um, how do you describe what you do? Well, my background is pretty eclectic. I guess I'm old enough that I've had time to try a lot of different things. Um, I think it might be interesting to just really quickly go through some of the different stuff I've done in my past because that might help answer a lot of your questions about why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Right. Um, before I do that, I, own, I don't see uh, what's going on on Twitch. Can you just describe what people see now? Uh, right now they see you. Uh, Got it. But we can easily queue up the uh, the video of the uh, robot or any of the other stuff that you have on your website. Got it. Great. Uh, so I went to Stanford and got an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in product design, which back then was half in the engineering and half in the art departments. Um, for my master's project, I designed some uh, electromechanical devices for people who make traditional animated films where they do pencil tests. And it was basically a mechanical flipbook where they could put their drawings in it and it would see the movement in their animation before they actually went and made cells. Um, this was before single frame video existed or computer animation existed. Um, after that, uh, I went to work for, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, when you say uh, a mechanical version of like a flipbook, is that something, I'm almost envisioning that as something like a, like a flip clock display or something like that? Uh, think of it as a tiny machine that's on your desktop and you take your stack of pencil drawings and you put it in and you close the lid, you push a button and it goes flip, 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 flip through the drawings. Okay. But, the, but there's a light that strove to sync with the drawings as they're going through. So it looks like things are moving as you drew them. Okay. That, that's starting to make a little bit more sense. I, I in college, I did a little bit of pencil test animation. I was never terribly good at it. It was a stepping stone. And, you know, eventually you want to uh, learn to do 3D animation. Um, and, you know, the pencil test stuff was... Uh, I've never been a tremendously good hand artist, but I did a little bit of that and had a lot of fun with it. Right. You've probably seen, like, films about uh, how Disney films are made. You see the, the animators are flipping through their stack of drawings like this. Right. My machine replaced that flipping through drawings like that. Excellent. Uh, but please carry on about, uh, some of the other stuff that you've built. Sure. So uh, my advisor in school was a guy named David Kelly, who's a bit of a celebrity now in the design engineering community. And I went to work for him when he had an agency called uh, Hovey Kelly Design. And I wasn't actually an employee there as a freelancer, but uh, one of the things that I worked on there that uh, – might have heard of is remember Steve Jobs did the next cube that black cube computer right uh, I'm the guy who designed the handle that went on the cube and uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the cube didn't have a handle on it so that was a pretty good indication of my design skills at that time <laughs> <laughs> I got yelled at a lot um, so I enjoyed doing product design, but uh, because of the animation that I studied in school, I really had a hankering to make my own animated film. So I uh, left product design for a while and did the starving artist thing and worked in a really good uh, Mexican restaurant waiting on tables. And at night, I would work in a basement in Palo Alto making a film. And it took four years to make an 11 minute film. It's a real labor of love. Uh, it was on a uh, four foot by six foot parallel panes of glass and I would finger paint on the glass and then shoot a frame and then move the paint around and shoot a frame and uh, it was about 7,000 paintings that I did for the movie um, which was ridiculous and if you're smart you'll remember later to ask me about 7-Eleven and animation because it's a good story um, so in the process of doing all that animation, uh, I got interested again in visual design and started a graphic design agency uh, that was in business for about 11, 12 years. Um, and I'm mentioning this just because it helps to explain my interest in visual design. And that, sorry. Shut up. 
shut up. How do I do that? Okay, I'll turn off my phone. I forgot. <laughs> no worries. Um, that company that I started was bought by another company called At Home Network, which bought or merged with Excite.com and became a stupid company called Excite At Home, which is the world's worst company name. Um, worked there for a couple of years with Golden Handcuffs and then joined some really smart people I met there uh, because they had started a company called Laszlo Systems, which um, was building a platform for doing rich internet applications. And that was a nice uh, combination of visual design and engineering. Uh, left the smart people at Laszlo to start my own company called Small Town, which was a VC-based uh, internet company focused on small business advertising um, and uh, played more of a CEO. You know, people misuse the term CEO these days. Yeah. It's the guy in charge of the engineers who were building the stuff that mattered. Yeah. What – um, what what time what era was that when you when you uh, came up with this company small town small town started in 2003 and we got funded in 2004 okay so getting towards the what we would consider the more the more modern version of the internet that we know it is today yes so for example we were struggling with whether or not we are going to use uh, activescript uh, or you know flash yeah versus html cuz html is getting better it was around that time when people were trying to figure out what to use for rich internet applications. Right. Uh, small Town was bought by Cisco. Uh, worked on a little project at Cisco because of it, uh, um, a telecommunications system for the home called Yumi. Um, and then did this thing which I thought was really great. Uh, I had this idea for a cloud-based restaurant and I spent a lot of time learning about restaurants and how they work and uh, did lots of uh, uh, interviews with restaurant owners and people who eat at restaurants and put together this business plan that I thought was fantastic, but it, in my opinion, was a little too early, and now I'm seeing a lot of what we proposed back then in lots of food-related startups. Yeah. Uh, so that didn't work out. Uh, then I wrote uh, an iPhone app called Peer Pressure, which was this fun app where you would set a goal and then you would have uh, people on email or Twitter or Facebook follow how you were doing on your goal. Uh, so if you're trying to lose weight, you'd have to every day your phone would tell you ask tell you to type in how much weight you lost, and that would get broadcast to all your peers. So it was a, a automated way to make you uh, accountable to achieving your goals. Um, and after that, I decided I would just be a full-time freelance inventor. So that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. And building robots. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to come back to the robots because that's uh, something that I think a lot of our users are really excited about. I know it's something that I'm really excited about, uh, probably right. just because it looks like so much dang fun. And uh, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm sure there's a lo there's an awful lot of work in there that is probably not a lot of fun, but um, let's talk a little bit about how you got started in that. Sure. Uh, when I was at Excite at Home, uh, being bored as the company went bankrupt and trying to figure out how to stay busy, uh, I decided I would build a super heavyweight BattleBot to compete on BattleBot, which at that time was on Comedy Central. Yeah. And I live in the area where the show was being filmed, so I was always in the audience. And finally, I had enough free time that I could say, okay, I'm gonna build a robot. So I built this really, really ambitious robot called Crazy Susan. Uh, and just about the time that I completed it, the show was canceled. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this stupidly complex, very heavy, very difficult to move around thing that I had created for no purpose. Um, and that's how I got started. Yeah. Now we uh, we're actually taking a look at the the video now um, of the the drive system prototype for Crazy Susan. And um, what what sort of environment were you in that you had access to start experimenting with with tools like these? Or what what were some of the experiences that you'd had up to this point that um, let you start getting ideas around what to prototype for its its drive and its its movement and um, you know, the sort of weapon systems we were going to have um, 
Yeah, how, uh, I mean, I've seen even for uh, we're talking about uh, this is in the uh, early 2000s. I mean, CNC was still popular, but not very accessible then. Um, yeah. So what 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 kind of uh, opportunities uh, let you start getting getting involved in stuff like this? Uh, well, I did study mechanical engineering, yeah. so that was always of interest to me, and I knew kind of how to get started. Um, I also, when I went to engineering school, drew things on vellum with pencils, so I wanted an excuse to learn CAD. So this was a project, and I, I chose SolidWorks and got to be good at SolidWorks. Um, and then I just was part of a community of builders and designers and engineers. Um, I, I knew a lot of people who worked in machine shops. Um, I knew people who were, you know, building incredible machines, uh, and I could tap into their uh, know-how and knowledge as well. Um, and then I had a good friend um, who had a very nice workshop, and he was kind enough to let me work in there. Um, so I had all the tools, the basic mill, a lathe, drill press stuff to make it. Um, and then a lot of the parts on Crazy Susan were just too difficult to make myself. Um, for example, there's this giant uh, water jet cut magnesium plate that um, gave me an excuse to try water jet cutting. And yeah. So on. Yeah. Boy, I really wish I could see what you guys saw. Are you are you showing the Crazy Susan video? Yeah, we're taking a look at that right now, and it's um, yeah, we're in in the in the kind of final section of the video where you're showing the uh, the completed the 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 finished robot. Got it. So when. Uh, BattleBots went off the air, there was still a strong community of builders um, who started uh, having other uh, events. So there was another uh, event that had super heavyweights, and I was able to take Crazy Susan to that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, one of the best known ones that's still around is RoboGames. And RoboGames, for anybody out there who wants to get into combat robots, is a great uh, place to get your feet wet because you don't have to be chosen to compete. Um, you just register and come and fight robots, and it's uh, it's a great way to get started. Yeah, and uh, well, one thing I want to mention uh, really quickly is that if you're not familiar with this show, uh, Meet the Maker is partially about my conversation with our guest, um, Hal Rucker, uh, today, but also it's about, if you're watching this live on Twitch, it's also about your conversation with Hal. Um, if you have any questions for him as, uh, as our conversation unfolds, please ask them and we will get those over to him. And we actually have one of our first uh, questions, a uh, really great question coming in from the chat, and that is from Sue Laren. Uh, how much electron electrical and electronics knowledge comes out of mechanical engineering? <laughs> uh, basics. Right, and it really depends on the engineer. I've I've learned more about electronics and programming, building combat robots than I ever did in school. Um, there is a big difference between a mechanical engineer and a, a, a electrical engineer, just like there's a difference between a a, a heart surgeon and a surgeon who operates on stomachs. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. Uh, I know enough not to kill myself. That's a good way to put it. That's a great uh, place to start. Yeah, <laughs> don't kill yourself. Uh, yeah, although I still make mistakes. The, uh, the the video you're watching now with that robot called Whoops, um, my daughter was driving it. My daughter's 11, and we should talk about her at some point because it's a really interesting story. Absolutely. And she was helping me uh, get Whoops ready for our next fight, and the chassis was opened, and a good friend that she had made at RoboGames had given her a, friend, a metal friendship bracelet. And she reached over into the robot and her metal bracelet shorted out a battery terminal and it turned into a little ring of fire around her wrist. Um, so that was in her introduction to the danger of electricity and uh, dad being really stupid. Yeah, was she otherwise, was she otherwise all right? She was a little scared, but everything was fine. Excellent. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, I think I was more scared than she was. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I think that would frighten me. Uh, that would frighten me as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's true of a lot of different uh, engineering disciplines and a lot of other you know uh, disciplines. Is that as long as your discipline touches other things, you're going to pick up little pieces here and there. You're still going to have your your speciality, but you know you're going to pick up a lot of other stuff along the way. 
Yeah, and I, I often uh, talk to people, I say, you know, I wish I was 16 right now because it's such a great time to be an engineer. You know, if you don't know how a circuit works, you can go on YouTube and learn. Uh, and that wasn't always that way. It was much more difficult to learn things and share ideas and share knowledge. And man, it's just such a great time to be a maker right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I, I still maintain that I have uh, almost zero understanding of electronics and how electricity works. I try to read stuff on circuits and circuit design, um, and it still completely goes over my head. Um, but I am able to look at a schematic, follow it along, and at least you know, maybe if I don't get it right the first time, I'm able to troubleshoot uh, my way through it to, to get it working. Um, and there's also, you know, wonderful learning applications. I mean, stuff you can download for your telephone that just let you put circuits together in a completely virtualized environment so that you don't, you, I mean, electronic components are relatively inexpensive. The only thing that's really frustrating is uh, sometimes they take a while to get to your house. And that's a huge bummer when, you know, okay, you shorted out this integrated circuit and it doesn't work anymore. And now you need to order another one. Uh, and maybe that's going to set you back three or four days. And that's a pain. Um, but the nice thing is this stuff is cheap. And uh, you can, uh, the uh, one thing a, a friend of ours um, from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, Matt Richardson, loves to use the phrase afford failure. I think that quote actually comes from Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. Um, but yeah, it's, when you can, you can make a lot of mistakes, and that's a great way to learn when you don't have to be constantly afraid of the, the uh, consequences of, of screwing something up. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, maybe this would be a good time to talk about BattleBots. Yes, absolutely. Um, should we get get ready to look at uh, look at Ringleader? Ringmaster, dude. Ringmaster. Ringmaster. Oh, my my apologies. Oh my, my apologies. God. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, actually, you, well, we we touched on Robo Games a little bit, and uh, sure. if I'm not mistaken, that's just the competition that's local here in the Bay Area. It is local to the Bay Area, but it's an international competition. Teams okay. from all over the world come for this thing. Okay. Um, but I've been there a couple times, and I, I would say it's kind of maybe the more the more punk rock version of of, of Battle Bots. <laughs> it doesn't have the glitzy presentation, but the competition is there, and it and it's it's real and it's amazing. Yeah, let's just say the a lot of the teams that do very well at Battle Bots are at Robo Games doing very well. Also. Yeah, it's the same level of competition. Yeah. Um, so right now we're going to be taking a look at. Um, the video from uh, from Robot Games here in the Bay Area. It's a competition between Whoops and what what's what was the other name of this robot? The the one with the kind of two big spinning vertical spinning wheels. Uh, that that's called Counter Revolution. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So this is actually Whoops's first fight ever. Uh, my daughter Hannah is driving Whoops. Um. And she got a lucky hit in and uh, tipped him over. And what kind of robot is is Whoops? It looks like a, like a flipper robot, or um, th they call them flippers or catapults or something like that. Yeah, uh, because the uh, the robots that have kinetic weapons are really dangerous. They're so dangerous, it's it's difficult to test them at home. Uh, for Hannah, because she was still pretty young back then, we wanted to make one that didn't have a kinetic weapon. In this case, it's just uh, a very strong pushing robot with interchangeable plows that can go on the front. Okay. In, in this case, it's a plow designed to fight, um, to get underneath the other opponent. Um, you know, so we had a plow to fight uh, horizontal spinners, a plow to fight vertical spinners, and then the one she used in this fight. Right. Um, and moving on to battle bots, let's take a look at... Um... At this other one, at, at Ringmaster. So, what was the experience of, of moving? Uh, is, was this your first time? Well, actually, no, because you were talking about um, uh, competing in BattleBots back uh, in the early days on, on uh, Comedy Central. But uh, what was the the experience of, of uh, getting involved in this this newer era of the uh, of the show? Wow, I could talk about that for a long time. Uh... Well, you can think about it in phases. The first is the work you have to do to get accepted onto the show. And it's a considerable amount of work. You have to uh, create a whole 
a whole CAD version of uh, what you're proposing to build. You have to make a video. Um, you have to fill out a form. Um, and there's a lot of people applying, so you put in a lot of work before you even know if you're going to get to participate. Then you find out that you're participating and you have this ridiculous deadline. <laughs> uh, I, I think I, I had about six weeks to build and test and operate the uh, Ringmaster, which is a lot of work for something that complex. And uh, then there's showing up and actually competing, which was about a 10 day uh, uh, competition down in Los Angeles. Um, and it's an interesting experience because it's a single elimination tournament. So you put in this huge amount of work, and if something goes wrong, or you fight another robot that's just designed to really beat you up, uh, you lose, and it's over. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very intense in that way. Uh, it's an interesting experience. Uh, when, And there's the whole television element. So you, you come into the open space, and the crowds are cheering and there's playing rock music and there's these flashing lights and the cameras are pointing at you and then you put your robot in there and there's more flashing lights and then it starts and it's three minutes that's, yeah that's if you last the full fight um and to put it in perspective hannah's driving and she was fortunate enough to win her first fight and she was shaking <laughs> Right, and that the camera came over to interview her, and I just, you know, made the cameras go away because she was hyperventilating and shaking. That's how intense it is. Yeah, I mean, no, at least granted she's a kid, but it's it's intense, especially the very first time. Yeah, I mean, when you're when you're dealing with with pressure like that of of dealing with you know months and months and months of work, all being decided in three minutes. I mean, even if you even if you win, there's no way that you're gonna walk away from that, you know steely nerves and all. I mean, unless you're you're really used to this style of competition. And yeah. that, that doesn't even guarantee that you aren't going to be put against uh, somebody like... Um, I can't remember the... I remember the name of the robot from the first season, uh, Tombstone. The, right. You know, just this hugely violent robotic threshing machine that just decimated people right up until the end. Um, right. You know, or maybe you might... Something that might be a little bit more of a fair competition. I mean, either way, you know, these are... These are these are tough games that are decided quickly, right? So the highs are very high and the lows are very low. To answer the question about what's it like, um, it's it's definitely a, a, a good experience from that perspective. Um, and on the topic of like a tombstone or a, a minotaur, that also a lot of those robots who do so well are robots that have been around for ten to fifteen years, and those builders have been refining those machines uh, over the years at places like Robo Games. Um, and to bring a brand new robot that you're putting into the arena for the very first time, it can be very difficult to compete against them. And uh, that's not to say they're doing anything wrong. They're, I mean, they've been working hard for 15 years making these robots amazing. Um, but when you only have six weeks to build something that's been refined over 15 years, 10 to 15 years, it's very, very difficult. Um, having said that, a lot of people do it, right? There were some rookies and brand new bots we'd never seen before at BattleBots that did very, very well. So it's a it's an interesting uh, interesting experience. Yeah, and so I wanted to talk uh, dive a little bit deeper into there um, because there's a lot of combat robot designs that have been tried and true over the years. I mean, there's the the spinners, the vertical spinners. Um, you know, people people always love to hate a wedge robot, um, and yeah. You know, so these these are robots that you know maybe some of them are simpler to build than others. Um, I mean, it looks I know it looks from the outside as a as an audience member, you know how hard how hard can it be to just build a robot with a big you know vertical spinning drum? Uh, and I'm sure it's actually right. quite difficult. Um, how do you approach making a new design, um, especially when yeah, you have you have plenty of time to design it, but in six weeks to build it, that doesn't give you a whole lot of time to back out or or work around troubles with your design. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, um, especially because we, in in that competition, we saw some really really wild designs that um, I think even even on the outside, it, you know, maybe you might think oh, I don't know if that's going to work. That you know that <laughs> that spinning blade looks doesn't look like it has the strongest attachment to the rest of the body. Um, Right, right. Uh, 
I think different builders are in the game for different reasons. Some people are in it to win it, as they say, and they build very simple, familiar, strong, reliable robots. And other people are in it, uh, and I would describe myself as one of these people, although I'd love to win. But uh, for me, a lot of the fun is building something that people haven't tried before or something that I've never tried before. So if you were to like look at the robots I've built since my first one, they're all pretty different. Um, so I think uh, part of the answer to your question is it depends which builder you're talking to. Yeah. Um, sometimes, and for me this is the most interesting part of the sport, is it's like an evolution. Someone will try something new and it's very successful and then the whole community has to figure out how to beat it. And it's becoming more and more rare that someone can do that, but you still see it every once in a while, and it's it's really fun. I think at uh, this uh, last season of BattleBots, although it's not completely new, people did a better job with it. There were a lot of robots that had saws that came down and cut through you. Uh, and uh, one of those in particular, uh, Red Devil, did really well. Um, and it's just a really difficult engineering a challenge, and I think he pulled it off very well. Um, so there's the fun of trying something new, but you're at the risk of just getting clobbered by Tombstone and and the likes, or thrown out of the arena by Bronco. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a risk. It's a risk, but it's a fun risk to take. Yeah. Um, um, regarding regarding your question about the schedule, I think myself and a lot of the people who are building new robots, uh, trying to meet the schedule, you're making compromises up to the very end. And in my case, one of the compromises that killed me was um, uh, I have that metal spinning uh, ring that goes around the outside. Uh, we finished uh, seeing, seeing that giant 95 pound piece of steel about a week before the competition. And the plan was to get it heat treated uh, to make it stronger and more durable. Uh, but the heat treater told us that that metal ring might warp when it got heat treated. So at the last minute, we had to make the decision, do we go with a softer steel or do we heat treat it like we were going to, but risk bending it? And if it bends, it wouldn't work. So we decided, let's just go with a softer steel. And that's actually the part that failed in our fight against Spike Force and why we lost. Mm, that's a shame. Um, I did, uh, well, we have a couple of really awesome questions from the chat. Uh, one is from... Uh, Fry guy ten thirteen. What's the most exotic material that you've ever worked with? <laughs> huh. I would say, actually, can I go get a part and show it to you? Of course. I'll be right back. And while he is going to get, oh, well, there it is, right there. Never mind. So this is the chassis from the Ringmaster. Right. Um, this is machined out of one magnesium billet. So this was one big block before it was machined. Um, magnesium lights on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And if it lights on fire, I know this one. If it lights on fire, uh, you, you don't put the fire out because the fire doesn't go out. Right, you especially don't put it out with water. No. Because it will explode. So I don't know if that's very exotic material, but it's, I think, an exotic use of the material. Um, I don't think very many people machine a solid billet of aluminum like that because you have, you have hundreds of pounds of chips yeah. that are little fireworks ready to go off. Um, so the magnesium was an interesting challenge. Um, it machines like butter, though. It's great to machine, um, and it's remarkably strong. For its, it has a really high strength to weight ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, this this weighs about thirty percent less than the equivalent aluminum. So it's one of the ways that we are able to get a big, heavy ring around the outside. Yeah. Um, and another question that came in from the chat is, um, uh, did you well, did you do all the metal work yourself? No. For two reasons. One. Um, there's not enough time for me to do it all myself, in the case of BattleBots, at least. Yeah. Uh, and two, uh, the machine that 
made this uh, was a giant, giant mill. Um, maybe this would be a good time to show one of the videos. Um, Which one? If you go to Robots, The Ringmaster, um, if you scroll down, there's one with a Team Black and Blue logo. Yeah. Let's see if I can get this. That's a time lapse that I made of this part being made. Um, give me a quick second, and I will be able to pull that up. Um, in the meantime, start start telling some of the, the story here. Right. So this part was on the CNC mill uh, for six days straight, uh, 24 hours a day. That's how long it took to make that part. Um, and this would be a great opportunity to talk about some of my sponsors. <laughs> on the wall back here, uh, the one that says SVP, Silicon Valley Precision. Yeah. That's, that's the great machine shop that made that part. Awesome to work with. If you need some complicated CNC machining done, call those guys, Silicon Valley Precision. And just so I don't forget, Proto Labs, a uh, website where you can email a file and get a perfectly made part back. Uh, they do additive, they do subtractive manufacturing, and now they also do uh, injection molding. Max Amps, fantastic batteries for any project that you need a, a lithium ion battery. I don't know if they do other kinds, but the uh, uh, those they make great batteries. And then Esprit is the um, CAM software that Silicon Valley Precision uses to make really, really difficult CNC parts. All right. And that's amazing software. Let's take a look at this video of, um, of Ringmaster, Ringmaster being made. And you said this is a, a, a six day CNC? Yep. Uh, and this is just uh, for, the single, for the single part? Yep, for that yeah. one part I just showed you. Yeah. Is it um, playing? I, I can't see. Is it, it is playing? playing. Yeah, and uh, right now it just it looks like it's milling out the um, the center of the piece here. And it, given my okay, I finally saw a hand there, because otherwise, given <laughs> given the scale that I'm used to seeing CNC at, I would have assumed that this is this billet is maybe I don't know twelve, maybe fourteen inches wide or long. No, I think it's uh, forty eight by forty eight. Yeah, that is that is incredible. Right, so those guys really pulled a rabbit out of a hat. And I remember uh, towards the end of the video, you'll see the uh, they do a different setup where the a huge uh, end mill comes down and cuts out some windows in the side of the part. And it was chattering like crazy. You know, it was like day six, and it just sounded like the whole part was just going to explode. Uh, so I literally had to leave the building because the sound was driving me crazy. Yeah. Uh, I was so worried that something was going to go wrong. Yeah, especially when I mean you're you're on day six of this part. Obviously, at that point, you're not going to be salvaging the part. You know, if anything no. goes terribly no. wrong and and chatter, I am only barely learning CNC, uh, and I'm you know because I'm working with relatively um, accessible machines like the wood CNC routers. Even though I'm I'm not. I, I, I do enjoy working with wood. Uh, I am much more interested in working at least with aluminum. So I'm trying to see what some of my capabilities uh, to uh, do this on my own are. And uh, chatter is is nightmare inducing because you either <laughs> you either think you're going to lose the part, the bit, both uh, might end up you know breaking something and shooting it across your workshop, which you know maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but yeah, that that stuff is really unnerving. Yeah, you don't want it to happen the couple of days before you have to drive down to LA and compete. No, especially because you know even if you uh, well, it, but by that point you wouldn't even have time to machine another part, assuming that you could even easily get your hands on another part of this size. Right. Okay, now I'm now I'm seeing, I was wondering if you managed to do this entire part with only three axes, and now I'm seeing that you starting to yeah. uh, get around the outside of it. This must be a massive CNC machine. Yeah, uh, let's see. The bed on the first one, there's two machines there. The first one, I think the bed was about 20 feet long. Yeah, that's, that is incredible. Yeah. Silicon Valley Precision.
Yeah. They're great guys. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, I'm going to take a quick look at the, uh, the, the chat here. Um, uh, do you have any advice for those trying to get a potential spot on season three of battle bots? <laughs> Is there a season three of BattleBots? Do you know something I don't know? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen anything confirmed yet. I certainly hope so. Yeah, me too. Uh, assuming there's going to be a season three, you have to get into, you have to wear the shoes of the producers and empathize with what they need, right? They need a robot that's going to show up and work. So something about your presentation needs to convince them that you're capable of building a robot that works. Uh, clearly, the best thing you could do is build it now and show it to them, but that's a risk, of course. Uh, the other thing they're looking for is originality. Uh, they want to keep their audience's interest high, and if the same robots keep showing up, uh, that's not going to keep the audience entertained. Um, so I would try and come up with an idea that has some element in it that... Uh, makes the producers go, wow, I'd like to see if that actually works. Um, and then another thing they're looking for, uh, which I think helped us get accepted, is, uh, how would I describe it? Uh, a robot that uh, looks good in front of the cameras, right? I, because of my uh, background in design, it's important to me that things look good and um, I think we had a nice theme with the spinning ring and the circus theme and the robot looking like it came from a circus and Hannah the driver was wearing a ringmaster's outfit. So there's a fine line there. At some point you get to be kind of corny and tacky, but on the other hand, they don't want just another aluminum box with wheels on the side. Right. Um, this... so I think those elements all help. Yeah, and that's one of the things that always really impressed me about the show BattleBots is is while their presentation as they as they aired it, you know, it was a little corny, um, yeah. and 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 a little goofy. And the things that started to grate on me early on of how at the start of every fight, it you know, hearing it's robot fighting time, I ended up loving that more than anything else. Well, not more than anything else, but I ended up loving it a lot more than I was expecting of, of just hearing that and then getting getting set for the next fight. Um, but that aside, I mean, you peel back the layers of that corniness and there's a lot of really authentic maker engineer stories there. And, and uh, I, I thought um, that show was absolutely wonderful. And I certainly hope that uh, that there is a, a, an opportunity for a season three. But uh, you, you were mentioning yeah, I, there. A, I am. Um... I remember somebody telling me that if you could take apart a car and put it back together, you learned everything you ever needed to know about engineering, right? All the mechanical systems are in there, the electrical systems and so on. A lot of that is true for building a robot too. Yeah. Um, so if you can build a battle bot, you've, you know, you know a lot. Yeah. And in the and, mean, and, and the reason I bring that up is personally, I know why they don't do it, but personally I wish there was a little bit more of a, an element to the show that went into the robot and explained how things work and why things don't work and a little bit more engineering involved. And uh, they might do that in the future, but I think a lot of people um, don't have the patience for that. Yeah, I know I certainly would, but yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> unfortunately our audience is made of more folks than just, the, than just me. Um, right. And so you want you mentioned there uh hannah your your driver um and do you want to talk about your the reason why you wanted to have your daughter also be the driver of your robot and uh how you how you assembled your team well the real reason is i'm a terrible driver <laughs> <laughs> so that solved that problem uh You know, I've been building these robots for a long time, and as she was growing up, she saw what I was doing and got more and more interested in it. Um, it's kind of a dangerous thing, and uh, I think a lot of parents' expectations for how quickly kids can learn STEM-related stuff is out is is not real. Uh, it's it's a very slow ramp. So I wanted to start slowly with her, and you know, this is a motor, this is a battery, this is a screwdriver kind of thing. So we built um, 
two identical 60 pound robots that were very, very simple. And she drove one and I drove the other. They're called black and blue. I think there's some video yeah. of you... black and blue you can show. Um, there's some cute ones of her driving. Um, and so she started driving her own robot and um, actually doing much better than me. Uh, and beyond um, just getting introduced to basic engineering principles, the idea of being in front of an audience and being under the stress of a competition, I think was a good thing to expose her to at a young age. Um, and then when it, she got a little bit older and driving bigger robots like Whoops and then the Ringmaster, um, I think it's just because she's better at it than I am. Um, she's a really good driver. Um, it might be because she's younger and her coordination skills are better than mine, but I think mainly she she doesn't get as stressed out as I do. I, like, I, I got to win, and I think she just thinks it's fun. Um, what is it that, that makes a good driver? Uh, the hand-eye coordination is fundamental, and then there's the strategy. And for every type of robot, the strategy is different. And if you can stick to the strategy, that makes you a good driver. Uh, in the case of whoops, it's always keeping pointed at your opponent and then slamming into them at the right moment and not letting them uh, hit you in your soft spots like your wheels. In the case of the ringmaster, it's very different. In the case of the ringmaster, our number one enemy is the arena. We don't want to hit the walls because it takes all energy all of our own energy and and uh, focus it back at our own machine and we don't get any points for beating up the walls so when Hannah was driving her goal and you can see this if you watch some of the videos is to stay in the middle and let the opponent come to that come to her to avoid getting slammed into the walls um, and then uh, I think the most important thing about being a good driver is recognizing that you need to be a good driver. And I don't mean that flippantly, but it's a lesson I learned myself, which is you put all this time into building a robot and you go to the competition, you've only driven it a few minutes and the driving skills are equally or even more important than the actual machine you're driving. Um, and you can see that if you go to robo games, uh, the best drivers win, it's not yeah. the best machines. Yeah, I mean, because there's so much strategy around maneuvering, uh, particularly in battle bots where you have, um, you know, the, the arena itself is weaponized to make sure that you don't get caught out, um, that you don't get caught out by the, the weaponized arena, that you're trying to lure your opponent into letting them do that while keeping yourself safe, um, driving around a weapon that might be superior to yours. Um, right. Yeah, because we saw a lot of that in BattleBots of, of applying the strategy of, of letting them get overconfident or or get cocky with a, a weapon that's maybe has you outgunned, but you can you can still let them hurt themselves. Right. And the the proof of that is if you look at the teams that did well, even the teams that had new robots that did well didn't have new drivers. Right. I don't think there are very many cases where a new driver and a new robot showed up and did well. Um, so new robot, old driver is a, is a pretty decent combination. Yeah. Um, and I want to uh, actually uh, check in on chat here and see if there's any uh, – uh, no, not, no. Uh, and again, if you have any questions for Hal while we're talking here, please leave them in the chat below and we'll make sure to get those over to him. Uh, I do want to change gears a little bit here because you were, you've you been touching on this entire time. I have this background in traditional design. Um, and you've also applied that along with your um, your mechanical engineering knowledge to produce these robots that are elegant and look great and um, and also are uh, strong combatants in the arena. Um, where do you find that crossover between traditional design um, as it applies to like fine art design, graphic design, and um, your your engineering design? Um. Part of it is uh, personal interest. You know, as a maker, what do you want to spend your time on? 
And I think part of it is philosophy of what is a well-engineered thing. Um, at one extreme, you have people who, if it works, it's done, and other people who say, if it's not beautiful, who cares if it works? Um, and I think the most successful designers are the people who acknowledge both points of view and try and come up with a machine or a solution that does both. Um, and that's, that's part of what the Stanford product design program was about. It was not just getting something to work and not just something to get, that looks good, but combining the two uh, schools of thought into one beautiful, elegant solution. Um, so I'm always striving to do that. It's just so darn hard. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, the expression, it's, it's really difficult to make something simple. It's true. Uh, and it's a frustrating point of view because when you do something that's really simple and looks really good and works really well, people look at it and go, so what? Because it's so obvious once you've gotten there. But the process of getting there is very, very painful. Yeah. Um, throw out a lot of complicated solutions before you get to something that's really simple and elegant. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the same uh, thing that always plagues – uh, people that are very good at infrastructure, things like, um, well, your bank or the your mobile phone carrier or um, you know your your broadband provider, is that when it works, nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, people only care when it's not working well. They'll they'll certainly complain about it when it's not working the way it ought to be. But when it does, it just kind of fades into the background and and uh, and you know just becomes an everyday thing that you you come to expect. And it's so hard. I mean, in the in the uh, combat robot world, uh, you know, there have been several occasions where I've designed something that people look at it and they go, wow, that's really too beautiful to fight. And then you put it in the arena against Tombstone, and they were right. <laughs> you know? it's, like, it's like, damn it, that darn spinning bar just ripped me to shreds again. Yeah. But it sure looked good for a few minutes. Certainly did. <laughs> um. Another great question. This one is from uh, Eman Made. Uh, do you care to touch on how you balance your desire to make versus uh, your need to run a business? Uh, my desire to make greatly exceeds my desire to make money, <laughs> but unfortunately, everybody needs some money to get by. Yeah. Um, for me, at this point in my career, it's a calculation of risk. Um, everything I'm working on, and maybe we'll have some time to go through those quickly. Yeah. Are, are there, there are more examples of things that might someday make some money. Um, so it's it's entrepreneurial in that sense. Um, I'm fortunate to have some successes in the past where I feel like it's not that risky for me to make some stuff and try and go sell it. Um, when I was younger, that would have been much more difficult. Um, but even, even having said that, um, you know, sometimes you wonder when you've put in a couple of months on a project and spent a lot of time and money and it doesn't lead to anything financially beneficial, uh, like, I should just go get a job. <laughs> just go get a J-O-B and, and, and make some money. But uh, I'm pretty good at uh, resisting the temptation to get a J-O-B. Yeah. Um. I'm going to just get this stuff ready to pull up so we can show some of the, uh, some of the things that you are working on. But um, uh, if you don't mind uh, sharing like what some of the current projects you're tackling are. Sure. So uh, I've done some medical stuff, really simple medical stuff, and I'll, uh, I, I have some show and tell. Oh, excellent. And actually, so, well, actually, let me let me get back to you here. I was just gonna take a quick peek at your, at your website and some of the uh, like the central line clamp is what I was just taking a look at. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna um, do show and tell for first. So here's the problem. Uh, this is called a central line, a pick line. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to the hospital and get sick, uh, they insert it into your arm goes into a big vein right there 
and uh, it goes through your arm up towards your heart. And it's a very efficient way to deliver chemotherapy or nutrients or uh, antibiotics. And when people get these PICC lines, <clears throat> they, they average about two weeks in the hospital where all they're doing is sitting in the bed so that a nurse can come by and do the infusion. And hospitals don't like that. They want to send you home. It costs a lot of money to have someone sitting in a bed. So they want to free up the beds. So they want to send you home with your PICC line so the nurse can visit your house and do the infusion. The problem is that about 15% of the people who get these PICC lines are also illegal drug abusers. Yeah. So you send a, a intravenous drug abuser with one of these home, and they go, I've got a portal to my heart, and they inject uh, drugs that uh, either kill them with an overdose or more often get a horrible, horrible infection deep inside their, their uh, near their heart. And it costs a lot of money to get rid of an infection near their heart. So I designed this clamp. It's a very simple device. Um, let's see if you can see that. Yep, you can see that pretty well. Going okay, a little out of focus works, there. How's that? Yeah, that's good. So this clamps over the lines. and snap shut. So at this point, uh, you can't infuse anything into the line. Uh, if you want to take the clamp off, you turn this knob, mm -hmm. and when it does so, it breaks itself. So now it can't be shut again. Oh, okay, so it's a single-use device. It's a single-use device. So it doesn't completely prevent the patient from tampering with the line. But if they do tamper with the line, the nurse knows it. Right. So, uh, so the hospitals are more or less reluctant to send people home because they know that if someone's abusing the line, they'll know about it. So that's one thing I've been working on. If there are any medical device uh, companies out there, give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite you'd like me to do next? Um, we actually have a bunch of um, uh, great questions from the chat that are, are bringing us back into the realm of, of combat robotics. No, no big surprise there. <laughs> um, one is, uh, did Adam Savage stop by to look at your robot? Uh, and is there any spending limit placed on you by the show? And that is from Lundegrass. Adam Savage did not come by and look at my robot, at least not while I was there. Yeah.